Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Welcome, and thank you for coming um, to our book talk tonight, uh, Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith. I'm Kaylee McMahon, the Research and Instruction Librarian for the Arts, the Department for the Study of Religion, and the School of Divinity. Um, we thank Bookmarks for supporting this event, and there will be books available in the hall outside for purchase. I think there's about three different titles out there, so um, so please take advantage of that, and then we will have Charlie doing a book signing afterwards in, those, in the room here um, with us. Um, our event tonight is being live streamed and recorded, and we will have time for Q&A at the end. Um, we're here tonight to hear from Charlie Lovett, a native of Winston-Salem, as well as part of the Wake Forest community. Charlie is the best-selling author of multiple books, including The Bookman's Tale, First Impressions, Escaping Dreamland, and most recently, The Enigma Affair. He has had a longtime interest in Lewis Carroll, which has seen him serve as the president of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America and as the editor of the Lewis Carroll Review. Charlie has also written or edited nine books on Lewis Carroll, including the focus of tonight's discussion, Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith. Stephanie Lovett is a double deke with a master's degrees from Wake Forest in English and religion. Stephanie is also well-versed in the world of Lewis Carroll, having also served as president of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America and written two books on Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. So we welcome you both. I don't know if you should be impressed or horrified that you have two former presidents of the Lewis Carroll Society sitting in front of you. Um, I, before Stephanie starts, I, sh I should add that Stephanie also named this book. Um, I, it, she was very instrumental in going over the manuscript uh, in, in process and, and uh, you know, sort of being an advisor. And at one point she said, what about Lewis Carroll formed by faith? I think I'd originally said Lewis Carroll man of faith or something. Yeah, it was a yawn fest. Um, <laughs> So I, I thank her for that as well. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. I'm certainly sorry. I apologize for not being Mark Goodacre. For one thing, he is delightful, as well as a really distinguished New Testament scholar. But even though I'm sure all of you are lovely people, you cannot compete with the sudden early birth of his first grandchild. <laughs> uh, so I'll be stepping in to talk with Charlie about this wonderful book. Um, I do have a background in Carroll studies and religion, sadly, not a professor at Duke, but I'm sure you're in for a good evening because this is just a fascinating book. Charlie, Lewis Carroll lived from 1832 to 1898, and there has been plenty of scholarly and popular interest ever since. There are quite a few biographies. And if everyone promises not to tell my Carol friends, I've actually not read all of the most recent ones. I was feeling done. Um, so there, are, there, are, there's a wealth of material. It's also a lot of work and a lot of time to write a book like this. So, what got you committed to doing this? What, what, what was your on ramp for this book? So I think um, it, it started by reading Lewis Carroll's unexpurgated diaries, which came out in over a period of many years in the late 90s and early 2000s, having had um, access only to an expurgated version that was published in the 1950s. Um, reading Lewis Carroll's letters, reading Lewis Carroll's lesser known printed works, um, especially things like letters to the editor and articles on issues like as, as divergent as vivisection and architecture and church politics and, and a number of other things. And I gradually started to see a, a vision of a man who, if he walked into this room and we said to him, what's the most important aspect of your life? He would not have answered writing books for children or taking photographs or mathematics or logic even though he was involved deeply in all of those things, I honestly believe he would have said, my Christian faith is the most important part of my life. And I started to realize how closely related all of these other topics were to that faith, how it underpinned so many of other things, how he saw his work as a logician, as work for God. Um, and, and I can give many other examples. But and yet when I looked at the published biographies, even including the biography, the rather hagiographic biography written by his nephew in, in 1898, right after he died, um, I saw very little attention being paid to that topic. I saw um, 
maybe in the really fat biographies, a chapter. Um, but usually it was more like a few paragraphs or a sentence here and a sentence there. Oh, he was a deacon. Oh, he was a man of, of deep faith. Um, so I thought, well, maybe this is an area that could be delved into. Um, and I wasn't necessarily thinking about a book at first. For, first thing that happened was somebody in 2010, there was a conference in Guilford, and somebody asked me, which is the place where Lewis Carroll died and is buried. Somebody said, would you give a talk about Lewis Carroll's funeral? And I thought about it, and I said, I'll make you a deal. I will give a talk about Lewis Carroll's funeral if I can also talk about what Lewis Carroll believed was going to happen after the funeral, um, his, his vision of the afterlife. Uh, and that kind of began this. And when I did that talk, I thought, well, this could be the last chapter of a, of a book. <laughs> and like as I said, that was in 2010, so it, it, it takes a while. Although I got distracted, somebody distracted me by letting me write novels for a while there. Um, and it easily could have gotten derailed by finding out that there wasn't much interesting to say, or that there wasn't much material, or that it had all been covered before, and none of those things happened. I found myself looking at vast amounts of material that had never been used by any previous biographer. Um, so if, you re if you've read a previous biography of Lewis Carroll, you will recognize the overall arch of he was born here, he went to school here, he went to school here, he went to Oxford, he got ordained, he loved children, he died, you know. But that's about it. Almost everything else is going to be new. There's going to be so many new names that you haven't encountered before um, of people who I think were very important in his, in his formation. And, um, that's really what kept me going on the project, was the fact that this discovery that there was a, there was a lot of new things to be said. I wasn't just going to be going over the same um, material again and again. And so that's kind of how, how it got started and, and how it continued. Well, in that vein, we were just talking before we started about librarianship and materials management, and that seems a big part of that. What kind of materials did you have access to that people hadn't been able to get at before? Because to me, that's a really interesting part of the development of this book. So there, there are several categories here. So one is things that people just never bothered to look at before, which are perfectly available in various different libraries and public depositories. And that included, for instance, most of the writings of Lewis Carroll's father. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. His, his father was a very important man in the English church. He was a moderate high churchman, and he was very involved in the education, early education of his son. Um, and one of the things that he wrote was a, was a pamphlet called A Plain Catechism. It was to prepare children for um, confirmation. Um, and I thought, if I could get my hands on that, that would be great. But I couldn't get my hands on it. It didn't seem to exist anywhere. But what existed was the appendix that he published for it that just listed all the biblical references that he cited. But by looking at the bi biblical references, I could kind of work my way backwards and see what questions he was asking the kids, the, the children, and what his opinions about those questions were. And it was, it was, I won't say easy, but it wasn't a difficult bit of scholarship to kind of work your way backwards and figure out a lot about how he would have taught children about the Christian faith. A previous biographer wrote, and I'm going to quote the sentence almost precisely, and this biographer is a friend of mine, I adored her, but she wrote, Lewis Carroll's father's writings were quite dull. One of them is nothing but a list of old Bible quotes. Um, so by simply not accepting as face value that Victorian sermons are dull and uninteresting and have no bearing on the life of Lewis Carroll, that opened up a huge... Um, bit of research possibility right there, to be able to read sermons that were written by his schoolmasters, uh, the, the people that he heard preach in, in Oxford and, and, uh, and while he was at school, other visiting preachers, and um, you know, sermons that his father preached, and, and many of these things had you know, really direct bearing on, on the development of the book, and they were there, it's just people hadn't looked at them. Ultimately, I did find a copy of the Plain Catechism. A copy came up for auction, and when something like that comes up for auction, and you're the only person in the world who cares about it, it doesn't even cost that much. So um, I, I got a copy at home sitting in a box that, that Matt made for me. So um, then there is this category of nobody had ever looked for it before because we didn't have the tools to look for it. So the biggest thing there was digitized newspaper archives, um, you know, Google Books, especially when, you know, uh, digitized um, uh, journals and things of that sort, where again, 
For instance, his father was very active on in early boards of education when that was like a brand new thing. It was this new idea. It's like, hey, you know, now that we've passed the corn laws and the children aren't working in the factories like children are supposed to, uh, maybe we educate them. We could do that, you know. And so, but there was a newspaper in every little town and it was published often daily and certainly weekly. And so if some guy gets up and gives a speech at the Board of Education, it's in the newspaper. And that sort of material would have been impossible to track down prior to digitized archives. It just, you would have, it would have taken tens of thousands of hours of flipping through newspapers in one library in London. And I've been to that library and I've spent a lot of time flipping through newspapers there in the 90s before we had these digital archives. So there was, there was that. And then there were the things, there were the serendipitous discoveries. Um, you know, I was looking for something else on um, one of these old rare book for sale sites, ABE or something like that. Um, I was looking for a book about his school in Richmond, the first, uh, his first, basically his elementary school that he went to. And here's somebody selling a set of manuscript notebooks written by his very first schoolmaster, including one which had notes of obviously you know, lessons that he was teaching the boys about, about religion uh, and morality and this sort of stuff. Um, absolutely invaluable resource and it just kind of fell into my lap. So, um, you know, in some cases as the people hadn't looked, in some cases it was people um, couldn't look, and in some cases sometimes you just get lucky, you know. It really is a perfect storm of your interest in technology and the knowledge you brought to it. It just, it just makes me really happy. <laughs> uh, one thing you and I agree on is that calling him Lewis Carroll when you mean one thing and Charles Dodson when you mean something else, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a stunt, right, to do that. It doesn't convey anything. Um, but there is another Charles Dodson in this book. You've alluded to him a couple of times, and he looms large over these pages, and I think that this audience would probably like and need to know a little bit more about him. So I taught, I was teaching in the continuing education program at Elon all day today, and I just decided to call the son Lewis Carroll and the father Charles Dodson. But in this book, um, I don't do that. Because Lewis Carroll was a pen name for certain writings and had very little to do with his religious life, right? So I really tried to write this book in such a way that I made clear if I was talking about Charles Dodson, the father, born 1800, died 1868, or Charles Lutwidge Dodson, the son, born 1832, died 1898. But the father um, was, was an important figure in the church. He, his career began, like his sons, um, at Christ Church, the college in Oxford. Um, uh, like his son, he was ordained a, a deacon there, and then, unlike his son, ordained a priest, and then, unlike his son, got married, which meant he could no longer be at the college, and so the college found him a, a, a church, you know, a place to work, paid him almost nothing, and he worked for, um, from, I can't remember when they went there, 1830 or so, until 1843, at this very rural parish, um, really working very hard at rural parochial work. Um, he, he, he built a Sunday school where there hadn't been one before. He worked very hard on education. He built, um, there was a canal that went through the parish and he built a chapel on a barge on the canal to minister to the barge, um, the canal workers. Um, but he then got a job from one of his old school buddies, a guy named Charles Thomas Longley, who was the first bishop of the Diocese of Ripon which was carved out of the Diocese of Yorkshire, so up in the north of England. And he got a job as the examining chaplain at Ripon, which, Ripon, which means he was the guy who basically gave an examination to people who were putting themselves forward for ordination and decided whether they were ready or not. Um, but Ripon was more than 100 miles from Darsbury, where his parish was, which meant every time he was going to do that, he had to get on his horse and go 100 miles. There was no, there were no railways yet. And so eventually they got him a job in Croft, which paid him, which is much closer to Ripon, paid him a ton more money for a lot less work. Um, in fact, he ended up doing very little work in that parish. He mostly hired curates to do the parochial work because he was now being appointed to other um, jobs at the cathedral and in the diocese. In the, in the course of all this, he published lots of sermons. He published one book. Um, and a lot of his publications were 
to do with various religious controversies, um, theological discussions about baptismal regeneration and about ritualism and, and a number of other things. And he, he waded into, um, you know, this, this was at a time when if one guy says everyone's regenerate after a baptism and another person says no, they're not, it, it's in the newspapers. Like, it's, it's, people are talking about it around the dinner table. It's not just a, something in the back of an obscure uh, religious journal. Um, but he also never lost track of the fact that he, he could at the same time be involved in these very highbrow theological controversies, but when he came back to the pulpit of a, of a small country church, he knew that those people didn't care about baptismal regeneration. They didn't, and and he, he understood that difference, and that helps us understand how he might have taught his son, because he was his son's primary educator for the first 12 years of his life. Um, that he probably didn't teach his son a lot about the high church movement or the Oxford movement or ritualism or any of these things. He taught them, he taught them about the basics of the Christian faith. And in fact, we have uh, preserved in the family collection a little set of cards each of which has a topic at the top, a topic like um, Christ came to save all mankind or things like that, and then a list of Bible verses. And we can see how he's teaching his children um, about these things. Um, so he went on to you know, a, a very successful career working for the diocese. He was an archdeacon. Um, uh, Lots of publications, which I actually have a bibliography of his publications coming out from the Lewis Carroll Society, I don't know, in a couple of weeks probably. Um, and, uh, and when he died in 1868, um, at about the same age that his son would die, um, Lewis Carroll said it was, or Charles Dodson, the, the son, said that it was the greatest uh, sadness of, of his life. His mother had already died, so I don't know what, what to make of that. But um, it's, it's clear his father was a huge influence, but I think it's also clear, or, you know, I, I try not to jump to conclusions in this book. I try to show you the evidence and let you decide for yourself, but sometimes I will suggest a possibility. And I think there's definitely a possibility that when his father died, um, he was torn apart with grief, but there was also a weight that was lifted from his shoulders, this weight of expectation that he would follow in his father's footsteps into a parochial ministry, which was not really something that he wanted to do. He liked the life of an academic. So, so I think his father was, was hugely influential in, in his life. Um, in life, and then after his father dies, it's fascinating to see how the son drifts further away from the high church movement, becomes much more of a broad churchman, um, realizes that there are ways for him to do some of these parochial things that he enjoys without actually taking the path towards being a parochial minister. Um, so a lot of that stuff happens after the death of his father. So, um, yeah, a very influential figure both in the church and, and in the life of his son. That's something I really think is important that this book accomplishes, is seeing the two of them as sort of uh, binary stars circling each other, and uh, that that relationship hasn't really maybe been brought out like it could have been in the past because people didn't know how to interpret what they did know about Charles Dodds and the elders. He's, he's some kind of clergyman or something who writes books, and, and so seeing that more clearly I think is a really uh, strong achievement. Um, you alluded a little bit to this, and I wonder if you could do a little bit more to help these folks here get into that Victorian headspace where, because it is startling. Maybe if you've toured Old Salem or have worked a little with the Moravian Archive, you have a little bit of idea of this, where people lived in a world where examining your own life was something you were meant to do all the time. Maybe you've seen some of those um, diaries kept by young women who are just in agony over what a horrible, horrible person they are and how they're going to try to do better tomorrow or next year. And then it turns out, you know, what they did was, you know, be rude to their mother or something. And, you know, that world where that is so real and so present to people, for, for most of us, I think, is hard to understand. So for Victorians, you said, you know, things are in the newspaper. Yeah. Um I gave an example of this this afternoon that I think I think sort of illustrates what I'm talking about when I say 
that you, as you said, you need to be in that headspace. You need to understand the context. Um, there's a biography of Lewis Carroll that talks about how miserable his life at, Christ, at Christchurch was because it was cold, it was drafty, the bed was uncomfortable, there was only cold water. And what this person really means is, I would be miserable if I had to live at Christ Church in the 1880s. That's, that's really what the, what the biographer is saying. Um, and I think about my own childhood. If you, if you brought a 12-year-old in here right now and said, okay, you can only have three channels of television, and you're not allowed any video games, no iPad, no telephone, no internet, they would go, oh, no, I'll be miserable. But when I was 12 in 1974, I didn't have any of those things, and I wasn't miserable. So you've got to get yourself into that, that imaginative world of what, what was it actually like for the people who lived there, not what would it be like for us if we got transported back there. And part of that is religion is an essential part of the national discussion. We have a national church in a way that even in Britain they don't have anymore. I mean, we have a Buddhist prime minister as of yesterday. You know, that was not the case. Um, although somebody said, somebody in like a major news outlet said, the first non-Christian prime minister. I'm like, um, Disraeli, hello. He's kind of a famous guy. Um, but, you know, r religion is, is at the center not just of of religious discourse, it's at the center of political discourse. Politicians are involved in these discussions about the about the direction of the church. Um, the whole idea of educating younger children is completely being driven by the church. There was a group called the National Society, which was a church group, and they said, we want to build a what we would call an elementary school in every parish in the country. Uh, and they started in the 1830s, I think. And within 20 years, they built something like 12,000 schools. Lewis Carroll's father built one. Um, they were called the National Schools. And so, so there was so much about just daily life and public discourse that was centered around religion and the Anglican Church. And that's the first thing we got to get our, our heads around. Um, yeah, and then the second thing is that you can go downstairs in this building and you can probably find some volumes of Victorian sermons. But you can probably also go out on the street in Winston-Salem and find somebody who would, who would say this sentence, oh yeah, I went to see such and such and it was as boring as an old volume of Victorian sermons. You know, we probably all, and you've got to, to wrap your head around a time when that wasn't boring. I mean, the only reason these things got printed is because people would buy them and read them and talk about them and think about them. Um, and, and, you know, in a fairly secular age, that, that can be a hard place for us to go mentally. I try as much as I can to take, take the reader to that place. Um, and one of the things I also try to do in this book, I try to not write a book that is intended only for people who are you know, academic scholars of religion. Um, if, if you teach at or attend the divinity school, I think you'll like this book, but you don't have to teach at or attend a divinity school to understand it. I really try to explain the, the background in, in church debate, in church politics that you need to have in a way that you can understand it, because I'm not a religious academic. Um, so I, I luckily do not have the language myself to obfuscate what I'm trying to talk about. <laughs> um, so hopefully it will, it will be understood. But yeah, that is, that is a hard imaginative leap to make in any work of, of history. Um, it's one of the things that historical, as historical novelists, that we love to do. Um, we love to take ourselves back and, and imagine ourselves in that space and imagine what it's really like to be a character in New York City in 1906 or in Oxfordshire in the 1870s or in an English cathedral 500 years ago um, or in a, a camp in World War II. I mean, those are, those are all places that I've been in my novels and it's the same imaginative exercise as it is for a work of nonfiction where you have to um, you have to forget this what would it be like for me to be there and replace that with what was it like for that person who actually was there it's something I did a lot as a Latin teacher too um, so given that milieu that's so different from ours do you think 
growing up in it and living in it that Charles Dodson was more religious than other men like him, other men that taught at Christ Church or even in his own family or what distinguishes his religious orientation, I guess, from others around him? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a interesting question. And of course, I studied him more than I studied those people around him. But it fascinates me that he has been called by some of people who knew him um, a little bit too puritanical and by others as not nearly puritanical enough. Um, and I usually, if you're being criticized for being too much of something and not enough of that thing, it usually means you're in about the right place. It's my experience in, in life. But, um, you know, his, I think one of the reasons he did not want to go under the priesthood, there are a lot. Um, it's about a chapter and a half of information scattered through my book about why maybe he didn't proceed to the priesthood and was only ordained as a deacon. Um, but I think one of the reasons was, you know, he enjoyed worldly pleasures. He enjoyed going to the theater. He enjoyed, you know, um, doing things that would have been a little bit harder for him to do as an ordained priest. Um, and so in those ways, he might have been a little more liberal than some. On the other hand, at a time when the idea of keeping Sunday absolutely sacrosanct and only reading the Bible on Sundays was sort of fading away, um, you know, he still had some rules for himself about about Sundays. He would uh, he would always attend church unless he was laid up with illness. Um, often he would attend church twice in the, in the morning and the evening, um, and he would never accept a social engagement on a Sunday. Now, it didn't mean that he didn't socialize on a Sunday. It just meant that if you sent him an invitation and said, would you like to come for tea on Sunday? He would say, no, we'll not come for tea on Sunday. But if he was out walking with you in the, in the meadows and it happened to be Sunday, he would be perfectly happy to chat with you all afternoon. It just wasn't a social engagement. you know. Um, and and I, I think there were certain areas where he might have been a little more... Um, I don't know if conservative is quite the right word, but, but more aware of of the the religious ramifications of certain actions than some of his colleagues. In in particular, um, he was very uh, not really on his high horse, but he was he was very aware of the idea of reverence, and he used this word reverence over and over and over again. And he he talks about this from the time he's a young man until. The, his penultimate sermon in um, 1897, before that probably about a 50-year period that, he, that we hear him talking about this idea of reverence. And he says that, that things which are holy should not be the subject of humor um, and, and irreverence. And when he says things that are holy, he not only means the church and scripture and Christ and the life of Christ and the apostles and, and uh, you know, bishops and priests, but he also means, um, as he says, evil spirits and Satan and eternal punishment. That These are not things to be made light of. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons that he gives for this is sort of a specific example. Is he says, imagine you're on your deathbed and that you want to be comforted by a favorite piece of scripture. But when someone reads that piece of scripture to you, your mind immediately goes to some joke that somebody made about it in the common room last week. Um, what a tragedy that would be. Well, he, he, you know, he kind of has a point. Um, but he, he beat that drum loudly for a lot of his life in scolding his colleagues in the common room, in uh, writing letters to theatrical managers saying, uh, you need to take out this joke about baptism or this uh, bit of irreverence. Um, he, he asked, he thought, he wrote Alan Terry and said, you need to change the end of um, Merchant of Venice because Shylock is forced to become a Christian and that's not how you convert people to Christianity by forcing them. That's just not how it works. And again, he sort of has a point. Um, and yet the Gilbert, you know, he, write, he wrote this article called The Stage and the Spirit of Reverence where he sets out his ideas about, he sort of justifies his attending the theater. Um, and he wrote in a letter to somebody one time. He said, just because something is capable of being used for evil ends doesn't mean that we should never use that thing because maybe it's also capable of of being used for good, or at least for things that are innocuous. And the three examples he gave was uh, drinking. He was a moderate drinker who enjoyed making fun of teetotalers. Um, reading novels, and you know, yes, 
you can read a novel and it can be full of coarseness and, and what he would call unwholesome, you know, what we now call a Charlie Lovett novel. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you could also read novels that are uplifting and, and celebrate the good things about humanity and going to the theater. And he said, going to the theater can be a wholesome, uplifting, enriching, um, soul-enriching experience, um, or it can be something that's, you know, coarse and degrading, and you just have to pick the right theater. And so he wrote this whole, this whole article about that. And as Stephanie alluded to, one of the great examples that he gave was, you know, there are really only two, he went to hundreds of plays in his life, and there's really only two categories of them that we still see performed today on any kind of regular basis. One of them is Shakespeare. Um, he saw all the great Shakespearean actors from Charles Keene in the 1850s to Henry Irving in the 1890s. Um, and the other one was he went to almost all the original productions of the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Um, but the Savoy Theater at Christmas time, Christmas time was a, in England was a very popular time to do um, what they call pantomimes. It's not quite what you think of when you hear the word pantomime. But these were um, a lot of times sort of fairy tale based theatrical productions. There was one of Alice that they did that had largely casts of children. And so the Savoy every Christmas would do a Gilbert and Sullivan opera performed by children. The first time I ever saw, maybe the first time I ever saw a musical was the ninth grade at Summit School. I was in the first grade, and the ninth graders did uh, HMS Pinafore, and I, I'm sure as my siblings will tell you, was singing those songs for the rest of our childhood. So it was, you know. Um, but Lewis Carroll went to see these, these children perform HMS Pinafore, and when it gets to the part where the captain finally swears a big, big D, and the sisters and cousins and aunts sing, he said, damn me, he said, damn me, you're the monster over to that way. Well, he was horrified. Because he said, you know, you're taking these, these innocent creatures, and it's important to know that for Lewis Carroll, a child was, as he said, fresh from the hands of God. To him, a child was almost angelic. And you're putting in them, their mouths these words about eternal damnation. And he just thought that was not what he would call a referent. So, um, so in some senses, like the idea of reverence, I think he was... He was probably more puritanical than some of the people around him. Uh, but in other senses, and his willingness to go to the theater, and, and in some other ways, he was, he was less so. So, um, and, and it, you know, it sort of manifests itself in different ways in, in different people, especially at that time. Um, which I think is why we have some people saying, oh, he was, he was overly puritanical, and other people going, well, he's certainly quite liberal, you know, because it just depended on what, what part of him they were, they were paying attention to. He is full of contradictions, and it it's really fun to, to poke at these and think about a little bit. I mean, when we look at what he looks like, he looks so removed from us with that hair and the outfits, but his hair and clothes were old-fashioned even for the time. He was affecting a, an old-fashioned look. and. You know, with his dates, his dates are almost exactly the same as Whistler. When you think about like Whistler's nocturnes and the, you know, that that dash of paint on canvas that like Ruskin was so horrified about, you know, he's a really a really modern figure. Uh, he met. He seems partly removed to us because of that 1898 last date. Ooh, 1800s, but 98. And he was um, he wasn't that old. Uh, he was the first of his 11 siblings to die. All of them lived well into old age. Uh, so if his lifespan had been comparable to his younger siblings, he would have seen World War I. Oh, easily, yeah. Yeah, so he's and, not and, you know, it's interesting far that away when, as he feels. When you think of him in the 1890s and you think about the, the theater that we were talking about, you know what he never goes to see and never even writes about? Ibsen, Strindberg, Oscar Wilde, all of these things that we think of as the, the, the beginning of modern theater, you know, nope, he's still going to the old melodramas and, and, uh, and the, other, the other big category of Victorian theater that he wouldn't go to is, is the translated French farces. Uh, no, 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 that is, that is not on. Yes. We don't have any record of what he thought of Oscar Wilde, but I, I just so want to know. Um, uh, you almost said this, so I'm going to see if we can get you <laughs> pushed a little closer to saying this because it's something that really interested me. His, you might easily argue that his two biggest concerns in life are logic and religion. Mm -hmm. And so do you think he found that to be a contradiction? Do you think he succeeded in bringing them together? 
this is the this is the brilliant thing about Dodson is I think he absolutely succeeded in bringing them together, um, and the the best example of this is his writings on eternal punishment. Um, he near the end of his life, one of the books that he wanted to work on but he never got around to doing was a book on what he called religious difficulties. And he said, I want to set out all the arguments logically so that people will understand what it is they say they are believing or what it is they are trying to argue for or against. I'm not trying to change people's minds. I just want them to understand what they're saying when they say X or Y or Z. Um, and, and the example that he, the chapter that he did write of this book, it was never published, but we do have it in, in a proof form, was also the subject of um, the very last sermon that he ever gave, um, which was at St. Mary's Church to a group of, to, it was for the undergraduate um, uh, monthly service for undergraduates at Oxford. So it was several hundred undergraduates came to hear him preach about eternal punishment. And although it was dogma of the British, the Anglican Church at the time, that if you go to hell, you're going to stay there forever, uh, he absolutely did not believe that. And he was willing to stand up in the pulpit and say, essentially, I mean, he didn't quite go so far as saying the church is wrong, but he pretty much implied it. So, so he said, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to draw any conclusions. I'm just going to make this logical argument for you. So let's take it logically. We're talking about three statements. And the first statement was the absolute basis of everything that Lewis Carroll believed about religion and God. And he would not, uh, in his life, he was not going to not believe that statement. And that statement is, God is an all-loving God. The second statement is, it is possible to punish a man for finite sins infinitely. Right? You can only commit finite sins during a lifetime on earth, but you can be punished for them infinite. That is a possibility. And the third statement is, God would do this. And what Lewis Carroll says is, if you are a logician, if you understand logic, you will understand that you cannot believe all three of those sentences. You can believe any two, but you can't believe all three. Now, at the same time that he's writing this, he's also reading what everybody else is writing about uh, eternal punishment, and he's sort of incorporating their ideas about, you know, mistranslations of the Bible. Did this Greek word that gets translated eternal have shades of meaning beyond just everlasting? But he, and he never says, so you can't believe in eternal punishment. He just says, if you believe God is a loving God, you can't believe in eternal punishment. So he doesn't quite go so far as to say the church is wrong, but he certainly, certainly implies it. But it happens at this intersection of faith, logic, and, and research, understanding the, the studies. I mean, he had over 400 volumes of religious books just in his own personal library. Um, and I think we can... I think we could do well to learn from that. I mean, I think it would be great if everybody who professes to be a Christian would write three sentences up on the, on the board. And the first sentence is, Jesus Christ taught us to love everybody. And the second sentence is, there's some people over there who are really different from me. And the third sentence is, I don't love those people. And decide whether you think you can believe all three of those sentences. You can't. The logician tells you, you've got to pick two out of the three. Um, and so, you know, you can see this, the, the way he does this is completely relevant today, um, even to our, to our contemporary discourse. Um, but he absolutely uses logic in, in his religious arguments. And that's what he wanted to do in this book about um, what he called religious difficulties that he never, never managed to get. I wish he had at least written up the the table of contents, so we would have known what some of the other ones were. Um, I mean, I speculate on it a little bit, but it's, but, you know, because we do know some other things that he wrote about. Um, uh, but, uh, but he, and he has a, at one point he has a, um, a correspondence with an agnostic, and again, he sets out a sort of a logical argument for, for the existence and divinity of Christ. Um, so for him, not only was logic not contrary to religion, but it was a tool that could be used by the evangelist, essentially, to, to help people see the truths that, that they're missing because they're trying to believe logically incompatible um, statements. Yeah. I think that's my favorite thing about Lewis Carroll, is that passion for logic. It also makes him a great humanitarian, that you can't be 
a fully human person if you don't have the faculty to uh, understand what you're being told and evaluate it and see what's really being said and not be manipulated by others. And uh, he just, and he cares so much about that vis-a-vis -vis other people. A lot of those uh, newspaper letters that you alluded to earlier are things where he's just so upset that people are making specious arguments. Uh, he got very involved in the 19th century vaccination. Uh, uh, Anti-vaccination movement. Oh yeah. my God, and, and we don't know how much he really cared about vaccination, though I, he did because it made sense. But what he was so angry about and why he got so involved in the newspaper uh, about it was the proponent for anti-vaxxing was spouting all this stuff that made zero it's logical sense. logical arguments. He's like, you're you're not using your data to support you know what uh, what it supports. He was just enraged. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and he got, it got it got pretty nasty. And this was in like a little local newspaper in the town where he spent his summers by the seaside. But he obviously read the, the paper there during the summer, and that was the one time that he wrote letters to that particular paper. Um, but and he yeah, he very often is is using logical arguments in so many of these things that that he's writing letters or or pamphlets about. Um, you know, again ranging from everything from vivisection to um, how you know we, the the idea of endowed research was a, a fairly new idea at Oxford. And, you know, he didn't think it was logical to pay somebody for work they might do. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go too much off on that because we we'll probably have some academics here in the audience. But, you know, um, the idea that he's like, just give somebody a bunch of money and they'll discover something interesting. That's kind of the way he looked at it. Obviously, it's a little more complicated than that. But, but um, you know, he's, he's always sort of falling back on, on logic in one way or another. And he really believed that the work he was working on in symbolic logic um, was work for God. I mean, he talks about that. He talks about in the introduction to the, his first book on symbolic logic, which was the only one that was published. Um, you know, he says, the, what, the reason to teach young people logic is so they can spot illogical arguments, whether those arguments come from the politicians or from the pulpit. And he was very aware that the pulpit was one of the places that they came from. And he, he wanted them to be able to to logically form their you know, religious opinions and, and beliefs, uh, as well as their political opinions and beliefs and, and other things. But um, and, and in fact, at one point he writes to his sister, one of the reasons he didn't write the book about religious difficulties is he said to his sister, there are any number of people who could write that book. But I think I'm the only person who can write this book on symbolic logic. Um, and it was to be a three-volume book. He only ever finished the first volume. We have some bits and pieces from, from the second and third volumes. But, um, so yeah, I think it was, it was very much at the center. And he didn't begin as a logic teacher. Something he sort of came to a little bit later in life. He started out as more of a mathematician. Um, but especially after he resigned his lectureship in 1880, uh, we continued to live in the college. He could live there for his whole life, and he did. Um, but he resigned his lectureship um, partly because he could afford to, because he'd written this book called Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that was, you know, but didn't make him a millionaire or anything, but he was able to live comfortably and be generous as a result of that. Um, but also partly because he really wanted to do this other work, to write these books about logic and some of these other things. Um, and he was afraid his time would, would run out. Um, that's why he stopped being a photographer in the 1880s, in 1880, about the same time, you know. Um, and his time did run out. As you said, he died at the age of 66 and, and did not finish the, the work he had set for himself. The endowed uh, professorship problem connects to, you know, he lives exactly in this fascinating period when the university is shifting from being a church organization to what we think of as universities today, a, a secular uh, institution of learning. Yeah, kind of like what happened at Wake Forest in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, only, uh, only 100 years later. Yeah, we can talk about dancing now. Uh, but the, uh, that, uh, not to tax people's patience, I have another question and then maybe a little lightning round for you um, and then we'll wrap it up. The, uh, the idea about that whole fascinating question of what happened to Christ Church during his time there raises the whole thing that playing six degrees of Lewis Carroll 
just quickly get you to really every important public figure, every cultural phenomenon, anything you might be interested in in the Victorian era, you can get to in way less than six degrees. So were there stories you were tempted to tell, past not gone down, because the infinite regress just keeps going? Yeah. Or as a corollary, were there threads or themes that really you weren't expecting that you did find yourself going down? You know, the, I'm going to skip to the end of answering that question first, which is I did not intend this book to be the last word on Lewis Carroll and religion. I would hope that it is a book that will encourage further scholarship, because I think there's lots of more roads to go down. Um, the second thing I'll say relative to that question is, like almost every academic writer I have met, I bemoan the fact that all notes have to go in the back, whether they are citation notes or discursive notes. I want my discursive notes at the bottom of the page so you'll actually read them, because there's a, there's a lot of times when I think, this is a really interesting thing, but it's not like 100% relevant to the point I'm trying to make on this page, so I'll put it in as a footnote. Like, for instance, the first time Lewis Carroll ever saw Queen Victoria. He was a, he was a schoolboy. I had no idea. I'm reading the, I'm in the rugby public library going through the rugby newspaper, and here's the thing about all the boys from the school going down to see the Queen um, when her train comes through, and then it rains and she doesn't come, and they go back down the next day, and then she comes, and they all see the Queen, and she stands out there for a couple of minutes, and they wave, and, and you know, for somebody who wrote about queens more famously than anybody else in, in the Victorian period, that's a cool thing to know. It's not really directly related to his religious development, so you stick it in a note. So I encourage you to flip to the back. You don't have to read the citations. You'll see the notes that are a big, long paragraph. Usually those are kind of interesting little stories, um, and some of them may be things that, that provide future scholars with, with further roads to go down. Um, I think we could write a full-length biography of Lewis Carroll's father. We certainly ought to publish his father's works, either online or in print or both, um, because they're mostly only around in, you know, there's four copies of this sermon and there's two copies of that sermon. You know, they're, not, they're not available in every library, um, but I, at this point, have photocopies of, at least, of the vast majority of them, and originals of some, of, of, of a handful. Um, I think those are definitely, there, there could definitely be more, more work to be done there. Um, and the, the correspondence with the agnostic, I mean, that's a fascinating thing that I didn't get into uh, too far. I think analyzing his, um, his library, his theological library, I mean, I do look at that when I come across certain topics, for instance, come across eternal punishment, you go look to the library, see what did he have in eternal punishment. I've been trying to recreate that library. I've got about half of it now. Um, not his own copies, but just copies of the books that, that he owned. Um, and, and, yeah, some people will look at that and go, wow, this looks like a bunch of really boring books. But um, I'll give you one example, and then we can go to the lightning round, about how they're not boring. Um, I got a copy of a book that his headmaster at rugby had written, Archibald Campbell Tate, who went on to become Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and there was a sermon that he gave after one of the schoolmasters had died. Now, Stephanie and I both went to the same boarding school, and we were there, I think, in the same room when we heard that one of the schoolmasters had died. And it's a, for, for teenagers, that's a life-changing experience um, when one of your, your teachers just keels over. Um, and this is what happened to Lewis Carroll. And the next day was a Sunday, and the future Archbishop of Canterbury got up in the pulpit to preach a sermon about death. And about the third sentence of that sermon, he looked at these boys and he said, what is life? Is it all a dream? Now, he's speaking to a 15-year-old who is going to grow up to write the two most famous dream narratives in English literature, and who for his entire life, both in print and not in print, is going to use this metaphor of earthly life as a dream from which we awake to resurrected life. And here it is on the page when he's 15 years old. Um, I think that was the point when I saw that, when I thought, there's a story to tell 
here. This is a this is a book that's worth writing um, because it's not just he learned this stuff and then he was kind of religious when he grew up. A lot of it connects directly to his writings, his photography. Um, you know, his, we talked about his logic, and I think there are probably many more connections to be made. Um, this book was originally 190,000 words, which nobody in the world is going to publish. And I think now it's like 130,000 words. So I know there's at least 60,000 more words to be said on the topic. Um, so, um, but yeah, that, reading that, that Tate sermon was like a, a real eye-opener for me and saying, yes, there, there are connections here. Well, to conclude, you're excellent podcast inside the writer's studio always ends with a set of 10 questions that are designed to get a short answer from an author to reveal something about who they are and what their values are. So I believe that you are prepared to answer the 10 questions as Charles Dodson. Yeah, I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. Whom, in fact, you resemble a bit. So, uh, so, Mr. Dodson, what word do you love to work into your writing? Curious. What word do you hate to encounter in other people's writing? Um, any, anything that's coarse. Where is your favorite place to write? Well, my favorite place to write is at my standing desk. Very, very modern. Where could you never write? Mm, in a theater. To what rule of grammar do you pay least attention? Oh, the incredibly illogical rule about where apostrophes go in words like can't and don't. If you're, if you're eliminating letters in two different places, then you need to have two different apostrophes. So cannot should be C-A apostrophe N apostrophe T if you're going to make it into can't. That's just logical. <laughs> what was the first book you remember reading? Oh, The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. If you want to know what people thought childhood was like before Lewis Carroll reinvented it, read The, Sh the mm -hmm. Fairchild Family. It's absolutely horrifying. <laughs> what are you reading now? Well, since I'm dead, I can read whatever I want. So I'm reading this book, uh, Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith, to see if this guy Lovett got anything right at all. What book would you like to have written? Hmm. Gosh, I don't know. What did I say about that? You know, I kind of wonder if I would like to have written one of the George MacDonald fantasies, like At the Back of the North Wind, or, or Fantasies, one of, those, one of those books. What sort of book would you like to write, but probably never will? Oh, a book of relig about religious difficulties. <laughs> what would you like to hear a reader tell you? The, the thing I like to hear most is... I, I've donated a lot of my books to orphanages and to hospitals for children, and the thing that brings me the most joy as an author is to hear that a sick child forgot about their pain for a couple of hours because they were reading one of my books. Well, thank you, Mr. Dodson, and thank you, Charlie. That was a real treat tonight. And I think um, we probably have time to, can we, can we take a, I don't know what our time schedule is, but we can take a couple of questions if, if, we, if there are any questions. I mean, we might have covered every possible bit of interesting material. I don't know. Um, I don't know that you have, Charlie, but actually, my question is oh. Yeah. Let me um, give the mic to you. Oh, well, I can hear on the mic yeah. either way. There you go. I've never known, been known for my <laughs> soft voice. Um, so, um, I, I, we know what inspired you to write this book, but what inspired both of you to have such a, you know, a long interest in Lewis Carroll? For me, um, my dad taught English here at Wake Forest for 40 years, so I grew up understanding the value of text. Um, but he was also a book collector, so I grew up believing in the value of the physical book. And... Um, I used to go book scouting for him when, when I was a young man. And then I thought, well, it'd be cool to collect books. He, he was a single title collector. Um, he collected Robinson Crusoe. And I thought, well, you know, I listened to these records of Cyril Richard up in my attic on Robin Hood Road when I was growing up, reading Alice in Wonderland. I, I bet there's, like, there must be 20 or 30 different ver editions of that. We could, we could collect that. And, and that would be a single title. I knew nothing about Lewis Carroll. Um, I think we were convinced when we first started collecting together that uh, I'm not sure we want to collect through the looking glass, right? Just Alice in Wonderland. Focus like, is important that, in quality book collecting. But that idea lasted about two days, I think. <laughs> um, 
and, and it just turned out he was a fascinating guy. You, you know, I, I was able to go on a lifelong journey because he was that interesting. And he, as Stephanie said, he knew, you know, every famous Victorian author that you know, you know, most of them, he had met them, he'd met all the actors, he would show up at Holman Hunt's um, studio and say, hey, my name's Charles Dodgson, can I come in and watch you paint for a while? You know, um, and he just, you know, had his, had his fingers in every different pot and also lived in a time when the Victorian literary, artistic, theatrical community was not that big. Every, everybody knew each other. And so whether I was interested in decorative tiles or uh, William Morris or Burne Jones or whatever, you know, there was, there was always a connection there. Um, you know, I could have, I could have picked of uh, the water babies, and I don't know how interesting Charles Kingsley is because I haven't read it. Or I could have picked Holiday House or any other you know, Victorian children's book, and it, I might have one shelf of books in my house and a much happier family, you know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, ditto. But <laughs> <laughs> seriously, though, the we could have thought, oh, well, let's do L. Frank Baum. It'll be really interesting to do, you know, Dorothy and Oz. And it would have been interesting for a while, and no disrespect to our friends at the International Oz Society, but there, I just can't think of a literary figure that there is more interesting connections that just build and build and build. Uh, from a, uh, as you say, from a point of things you could be interested in knowing about, but also as someone's collecting interesting things to have. I mean, Bob Lovett had some amazing Robinson Crusoe stuff, but the Alice stuff empire is unbelievable. We have friends that, you know, have like additions to their house because there's any product, any, not only cultural things like plays and ballets and movies, but anything that you can imagine, there is an Alice thing of it. Soap? Oh, there's so much soap. It, uh, you, you gotta, you, you, we have a friend who, I swear I'm not making this up, her collection is Alice in Wonderland teapots. And she has like three or four hundred of them, and no two are alike. Um, one of the things I did do in COVID was clean out. <laughs> and I made this decision that um, I, I wanted my collection to be essentially a, a research collection, you know, somewhat an entertainment collection, but essentially a research collection. And defined very broadly, but that meant, you know what? I don't need a box of t-shirts. I don't need these spoons that have Alice in Wonderland on them. They're not nice, beautiful Victorian spoons that Lewis Carroll had. No, they're from some crappy shop in Wales in you know 1987 or something. Um, and I, I went online to this group called Alice in Wonderland Collectors Network that has 14,000 members on Facebook. And I said, Anybody wants to send me their address, I will send you a free box. I got those U.S. Postal Service boxes. I'll send you a free box of Lewis Carroll stuff. No promises about what it is, other than it's free. Um, I had to take the post down after about 15 minutes, because so many people responded. I gave away about 100 boxes of stuff during COVID, and my house is so much happier, and I now have mostly printed material. Every now and then there's something that really strikes you, but you know. One of our friends whose collection I especially enjoy uh, does what she calls flat Alice. Alice yeah, in advertising, yeah. um, pamphlets. Um, Alice's use as a, a spokesperson for things is absolutely astonishing and spans the decades and spans the industries. And so, you know, just as an example of the kind of things that you can, uh, as they say, rabbit holes you can go down, yeah. are, um, are Alice in advertising. And so it's not something you wake up one morning and go, I'm going to do this. But when you start into Lewis Carroll, there it is. The rabbit hole thing, one of our uh, friends decided to get a clipping service because he wanted to document Alice in the press. Because, you know, like you'll open the paper and there's a political ad where both candidates are the Tweedles or something like that. That stuff has been going on since the book came out. And he quickly realized that this was impossible. In any newspaper, magazine, any day, anywhere, somebody is going to refer to something as being like a mad tea party or some kind of reference will come up. Uh, but, uh, you know, m my belief is 
that, of course, is therefore completely undocumented, is that the rabbit hole reference is by far the leading one. Yeah, I probably so. Seriously, yeah. practically anything printed somewhere in it, someone will say, well, I just don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you end up with sort of sub-collections. Um, so for me, probably my favorite one is, because I'm a, a theater bum, is my, uh, my Alice in Performance collection. And I curated an exhibit at Lincoln Center in 2015 um, about Alice in Performance in a, in a pretty large gallery. And about 80% of the exhibit was stuff from my own collection. And I would, oh, I would love to be able to do that exhibit again because I've gotten so much cool stuff since then. Like there were things that were really missing. There was this one poster from a Broadway show that only ran for a week and I never could find the poster. Now not only do I have the poster, I have the original artwork for the poster from the artist. And it turns out he's the guy who designed like the Jesus Christ Superstar album and the Woodstock poster and some really cool stuff. And he like, you know, wrote me a letter when he sold me the artwork. So. Um, you know, it's, it is, it's never ending. And so you do, it, what's, what's a relief as a collector? I'm sure this is true for, for any collector, whether you run a rare book library or have a private collection, is when you come to the realization that completeness is impossible, it lifts this weight off your shoulder and it allows you to be selective and to create a collection that reflects yourself and your own passions and your own interests rather than this idea that you can get everything because I'm here to tell you no matter what you pick, no matter how narrow a focus you think you've got, you can't get everything. <laughs> the theater focus is especially nice though because it brings together Lewis Carroll's great, great personal passion and one of the ways that Alice has had a real impact on the culture and has, especially in the sense that I'm especially interested in of how the culture takes it and does a remix and puts it back out in the world as yet another new thing. So theater really I think is a great perfect storm for thinking about Lewis Carroll so we keep answering your question over and over how about some other and we're, you know, I think we're testing people's patience how anybody else anybody else well thank you so much for turning out on this beautiful evening when you could be sitting on your back porch um, and to one of my favorite buildings in the whole world. I spent a lot of my childhood in this building, so uh, it's lovely to be back. This is my first time back on campus since they reinstated the Charlie Lovett childhood version of this campus with the road that goes straight up. The, I was like, oh yeah, it's 1975 again. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. We do have books for sale out in the... I should say, very briefly, in addition to this book, there are copies of my new middle grade book, which if you have any children in your life between 7 and 17, this is a great Christmas present, uh, and my new novel, The Enigma Affair, which is just a little, a cute little story about a small town North Carolina librarian and a professional assassin who team up to solve a 75-year-old Nazi mystery. Yeah. For some reason, when I said that earlier today, people laughed. I don't know why. <laughs>